Grace to you and peace and fullest measure. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad indeed. Good morning. We're glad you're here. I invite you to sign in on the registers that you find in your pews uh, so that we'll have a record of your attendance. And if you're with us on Zoom, please put your name in the chat so that we'll have a record of you there. We have some announcements this morning. Uh, one is that Neil Pearson's memorial service will be on Saturday, March 11th at 2 p.m. And we ask that you join us in the sanctuary for that. Following the service, there will be a non-alcoholic wake in the fellowship hall with lots of delicious things to eat. Um, we have the Citizens Climate Education branch of the Citizens Climate Lobby that will offer a uh, seminar on Thursday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. in our fellowship hall. Dr. Laura Fisher and uh, Ginger Orton, Master of Science, will present information about climate change. And uh, we invite you to come and participate. Snacks will be provided, and Ed George is the person to call if you need more information. Um, we also have an announcement from Lon Franco. Hello, everybody. I'm just doing a presentation for you for our first concert of the University Orchestra. And we are doing Body Holy Hall, Cricket Theater, free entrance. And we actually are doing this concert that would be like celebrating our students. So there will be a conductor, student conductor, Beethoven Egmont, for example. Then we have alumni. Kathleen Felt, that is from Lubbock, who is doing a great career, who is coming to sing with two undergraduate students of ours, and myself. Oh, I'm not alumni, maybe, but I consider myself still a young student. <laughs> so it's March 4th, Saturday at 7.30. I left the poster outside, and we are doing also Don Giovanni this semester, uh, March 31st and April 1st, and then we are doing also a great piece with the choir on April 30th. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lon Franco. We also have an announcement from? From um, Carl. Yes. Okay. Um, today, our student NAPS group is putting on a little recital at First Presbyterian at 4 p.m. Um, and it'll have, I don't know if it's any of the people from this group, but um, some of our peers are singing in it. So Where it'll be a nice little recital for First Presbyterian. First Presbyterian. And what time? 4 p.m. at First Presbyterian, yes. a free recital. Yes. You'll want to be there. Okay, everybody put on your listening ears for half a second. I have something important to say. We were meeting this morning at 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall for our Lenten study. However, Apparently, 9.30 is too early. <laughs> so, we have moved the time of our Lenten study to immediately following worship with the invitation to you to bring your favorite snack or lunch with you. And after worship, we'll join in the fellowship hall. Our Lenten study this year is about healing and connection. And um, it follows the lectionary. And um, we're very much hoping that you will be able to commit to this time. We have childcare provided for anybody who needs childcare. And we so are looking forward to the opportunity to study the scripture together during this Lenten time of study. So I want you to raise your hand to commit to coming after worship to our Lenten study with the understanding that you'll bring your own delicious whatever. Okay, let's see those hands go up. Come on, come on, you can do it, come on. Come, nobody, not even the teacher. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there we go. 
see, we've got some people that are committed to coming, and we invite you to join us on this Lenten adventure immediately following worship beginning next Sunday. Next Sunday. So we didn't want you to be hangry this Sunday. Um, it, no matter what the gospel says for this Sunday, we, we don't want you to be without sustenance. Are there any additional announcements? Let us worship God. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship as printed in the bulletin. For 40 days and 40 nights, led, led by, by the Spirit, Christ fasted in the wilderness. For 40 days and 40 nights, we would prepare ourselves to meet the crucified and risen Christ. you to be seated. Friends, remember, you are a beloved child of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the grace and mercy you so freely offer us through the gift of baptism. You give us safe passage through the sea and let justice roll down like water. You deliver us from sin and death. By the power of your Holy Spirit, teach us to love and serve you faithfully and reconcile us to you and to one another as members of one living body through Christ Jesus. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. God calls us during this season of Lent to repent and be healed 
to return to God and to be reconciled to one another. So let us pray together a prayer of confession as printed in your bulletin. Merciful one, we are so easily tempted. We turn away from your word so quickly. We seek anything that claims to save us from discomfort, inconvenience, pain, fear, and emptiness. But these are false idols dissolving in the wind. You are our true hope and salvation, our hiding place, our guide, our guardian. We confess our transgressions to you. Forgive our sins. count our sin against us, but offers us the free gift of reconciliation. Friends, trust in this good news. In, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share Christ's peace. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness, guide us by your word through these 40 days and minister to us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let God's people say, Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Genesis, 
beginning in the second chapter, the very familiar story of the serpent and an apple, and, and I digress a moment, but I can't help, Gene and I watched Good Omens not long ago, and have read the Neil Gaiman book, and David Tennant plays Crawley, the serpent, who is sort of featured in this part of the story. But let's listen to Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loin claws for themselves. Let's join together in Psalm 32 as printed in the bulletin. Happy are those whose faults are forgiven, whose sin is covered. While I kept silence, my body wasted away with my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to you, O God, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. And at times of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eyes. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding. Whose temper must be curved with fitness and trial, else it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in you. We rejoice in you and are glad. Let all the upright in heart rejoice and shout for joy. Our next reading comes from the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all, because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, 
Just as the one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. This is the word of the Lord. We will sing uh, James McMillan's O Radiant Dawn next week. Uh, This week we will sing uh, Mozart's Ave Verde. Good morning. I am so glad you're here. I have a question for you. Would you rather have one cookie now or two cookies at the end of children's time? Two cookies at the end is a really good answer. That's the best answer. And Connor, you're going to follow your big sister on this one, okay? Good, 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 good. Good. You just passed what's called the marshmallow test. Yeah. Originally, this was done with marshmallows, but I didn't have any, so I used cookies. I'm sure you're okay with that. Did you know that uh, you're not the only ones to pass the marshmallow test? Jesus also did. It kind of sounded a little different in the Bible when Jesus passed the marshmallow test. Oh, I'm so glad you think so. That's really good news for you. Not everybody finds it easy. 
So, I think what we're going to do next is we're going to have a prayer so you can have your cookies. Are you ready? Ask your mom about the marshmallow test. I know she knows all about it. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you that you have shown us the way to wait for the right time to do what you call us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. gospel reading this morning comes from the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew. And I promise you, I have the liturgical hand sanitizer nearby, so you don't need to worry uh, if I have to use it after the sermon. Um, so here we go. I am going to read the two verses that immediately precede that fourth chapter um, because for two reasons, they will give you a reminder of last week's sermon, which was the transfiguration. These words were said then as well. And also it helps you understand uh, these verses from chapter 4. So Matthew 3, 16 and 17, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And then in the fourth chapter, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be pierced by the slanderer. He fasted 40 days and nights, and afterwards he was famished. The probing one came and said to him, that is probing, piercing, the one that needles you, the one that punches your buttons, that one, came and said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the slanderous one took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and it is also written, On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the slanderous one took Jesus up a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor. And he said to him, all of these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, my adversary, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the slanderous one, that is Diablos, left him. And suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of the Lord. 
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are several ways to interpret this passage. One of them is through the lens of literary criticism. Perhaps you know the story of The Devil and Daniel Webster, which appeared in 1936 in the Saturday Evening Review in a serial fashion. Or maybe you remember Goethe's Faust, that story of the man who sold his soul to the devil. Or perhaps you know a story even older than that, a Sanskrit story that talks about a skilled artisan who sold his soul to the devil in order to gain the height of his craft. Or one way to look at this is through the lens of Matthew's purpose in putting the story in this part of the gospel or having it at all. You see, Jesus is beginning to go about conducting miracles that only someone who has the power of God can conduct, but people will tell him that he is the devil because of his ability to heal. And so Matthew has to show us all right at the beginning that Jesus has already fought the devil off and that what Jesus does is not from the devil but from God. You can also interpret this passage from the point of view of the spiritual traditions. There is, of course, a long tradition of after hearing the voice of God or having some sort of spiritual experience, hearing God's call in some way on your life, the tradition of then going into the wilderness to fast or into a silent, solitary retreat. The Desert Fathers, the Aramaic tradition of stopping and listening to God. I did this myself at a place called Leib Shomia. Some of you may know. It is in South Texas. It's a house of prayer, and you can go there, and everybody there is taking a vow to be silent and solitary to listen for God. Or perhaps it is the long uh, tradition of the Greek Orthodox, which says that after you are ordained, the devil is going to come after you. And in fact, that's part of their ordination vows. Uh, You might have remembered we had something similar when we reaffirmed our baptisms. That is... The idea that once you're given power, the next thing that will happen is that you will be tempted to use that power in a way that is not according to God's purpose. And then there is the practical. What does this text mean for me today? And there are two ways to look at that. One is to say, what does this text mean for us today? Because we are a body What does this text mean for the world today? Or what does this text mean for me personally? There are lots of ways to ask the practical question. And if we do ask the question, how does this inform our life today? We have three things to talk about. One is the problem of hangry, which you all know from the Snickers commercials. If we don't get our bread and butter, we tend to get nasty. And so the temptation, of course, is to reach for that Snickers instead of for, well, I would say an apple, but that doesn't really work today, does it? (laughs) It doesn't really work this morning. (laughs) And so we have bodily needs that need to be fulfilled, and and sometimes uh, we rush into fulfilling them in ways that are not in keeping with what we understand our purpose to be. 
And then the second one is influence. That is, throw yourself down. The angels will catch you, and then everyone will know that you are from God, and oh boy, they'll be just lining up to hear what you have to say, Jesus. If you just follow me, people will love you. And then the third one is raw power, raw power. Raw power, you know, that's what the devil was promising Jesus from that tall mountain. Raw power, follow me and it's all yours. Sometimes the desire for raw power is comical. For instance, when a child or even a grown-up in West Texas says to the wind, just stop already. If only I had the power to stop that wind from blowing. If only, if only, or when, when I find, when this finally happens, I'll be happy. I want to talk with you today about influence, that second one. That one where the devil says to Jesus, just throw yourself off of this tower. It, you know, it won't be a problem and everybody will know. Everyone will know who you are. You'll prove it. I once went to a class at a place in Austin which is called the Seton Cove and it was established by the hospital there in Midtown Austin because the nuns there and other people in the community were convinced that there was more to healing than just Western medicine. That the, the spirit was somehow involved in healing. And I had been there many times and been very happy with what was presented there, but nobody is perfect, no institution is perfect, and I went to one seminar that was a disappointment to me from the beginning because the first thing that the presenter said was this. I'm assuming you are all here because you want influence. And that's a problem. That's the problem that we see in social media with people who want to influence other people mostly to buy things. It's a temptation in our current mainline denominations to want to have influence. Because, you know, once we did have influence, once we had a lot of influence, there was a time when everybody went to church and everybody was influenced by what was said. And we don't have that influence anymore. And it can be really tempting for us to try to find a way to get that influence again. But for what purpose? For whose purpose? That's really the question. Some of us gathered in the fellowship hall on Thursday night to watch a webinar about the E word. The E word is a word that Presbyterians don't talk about very often. Evangelism. Well, we don't even want to call it evangelism. We're much happier to call it influence, right? And after the webinar was over, we were all kind of disappointed. We were disappointed because she didn't tell us how to influence people to come to church. And boy, did we ever want that influence. We want to be able to get more people to come to church because then everybody will know about us and about how wonderful we are. And 
I think that all comes from God, I really do, but the example here is to say that there is temptation among church leaders, temptation to fill a spiritual emptiness or hunger, a temptation to quell the anxiety that rises up in us that says there isn't enough influence. And there is, of course, always the temptation for any of us to wish for raw power. You know, if I were queen of the universe, things would be different. What we're called to is to be faithful and to be faithful to God's purpose, to be faithful to the call that God puts on our life. And that's what Jesus did. God told him that he was God's son and that God loved him. And no matter what, needle or poke or prod or doubt the slanderous one tried to put in his mind, Jesus stayed faithful to God's promise for the purpose God had for him. And afterward, the angels waited on him. Amen.
present hope for women and men when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this experience, the Spirit brings God's forgiveness to all, moves people to respond in faith, repentance, and obedience, and initiates the new life in Christ. Please be seated. We come to a time of prayer of intercession. In Christ Jesus, we have a great high priest who knows our weakness and suffering. Therefore, with boldness, let us seek God's grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With boldness, we pray for the church. O Lord, our God, let us worship you alone. Feed us with your word, our daily bread, and lift us up on the wings of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, with boldness, we pray for the earth. In the Garden of Eden you've made, help us to choose the paths of life for the sake of your good creation. Lord, in your mercy, with boldness, we pray for all nations. Destroy the dominion of death, warfare, corruption, pollution, and hate. Give life to all people through Christ. Lord, in your mercy, with boldness, we pray for this community. Feed those who are famished, humble the high and mighty. Protect those who are on the edge of despair. Lord, in your mercy. With boldness, we pray for loved ones. Hear the prayers of all who suffer, whether in silence or with loud cries. Surround them with your saving grace. Lord, in your mercy. And let God's people say, Amen. And is someone doing a... Ah! <laughs> we did not rehearse. Good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Schoonover, and I'm a member of the Christ Forming Household. Um, we meet the first Monday of every month to discuss different programming for our church in terms of growing in our faith, um, doing book studies, Bible studies, children's ministry, all that good stuff. In your bulletin this morning, you will see a form. What I would like you all to do, because we need help, is to make sure you put your name at the top, if we already have your address, telephone, and email, you don't need to fill that out unless that information has changed. But make sure you write your name and then let us know what you would be interested in. Okay, we have, um, for example, the Lenten programming we're starting and we're, the, the study we're doing starting next Sunday after church. I'll be there, Brett will be there. Our wonderful leader will be there. We hope you guys come join us. Um, and take a minute to look through this and check what you would like to participate in and help serve our congregation. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. We come to a time of offering now as an invitation to our offering. Let's remember that Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Let us offer our lives to the Lord.
given us this life in Christ. Today we bring the gifts of our work and the gifts of our hearts. May all that we bring and all that we are be your means of grace in the world, that all people may encounter your good news and let God's people say, Amen. <laughs> give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right to give you thanks and praise, good and gracious God. You planted us in an abundant garden full of good fruit to eat. Even when we disobeyed you, taking fruit from the tree of knowledge, you loved us still, covering our nakedness and forgiving our sin. Blessed is the Christ Jesus, Tested in the wilderness for 40 days, Jesus taught us to seek nourishment in your word, to worship and serve you alone, and to commit our lives to your providence, protection, and purpose. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and make us one in Christ Jesus our Lord. Give us the free and abundant gift of your peace and your grace so that sin and death may have no dominion over us, but we might have forgiveness and fullness of life in Christ Jesus. Through Christ, in Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we praise you, God of glory, now and forever, and let God's people say, Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
the steadfast love of God, the abundant grace of Christ Jesus, and the abounding love and presence of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore. Amen.